It's really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank John, and I want to hi uh, really thank Heidi and the ladies outside for putting on what really is a fascinating conference. And for me, you know, any conference um, with interesting folk like you that's in Colorado, even on its worst day, is better than my best day um, in Washington, D.C. So I have to tell you, thanks. It's a real pleasure, and I've already really engaged in some interesting conversation, so much so that um, thinking about changing venues, um, maybe joining you guys in the Colorado Bar. Um, after about 17 years of government service, um, as John told you, I started out as a CIA case officer, um, I, um, which was the people that were assigned abroad who are responsible for um, penetrating the enemy, enemy excuse me, um, whether that's by electronic mean or by recruiting agents. Um, and then I ended up being the first woman confirmed as an assistant secretary of defense at the time. And my portfolio was the Middle East, Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, Western Hemisphere, Southeast Asia, Asia, Western Hemisphere, and then separately I had the NATO nuclear portfolio. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, is going to be not compliance oriented and not even necessarily legally oriented. It's going to be providing context um, for what um, Ed and Sarah gave you that I think is very applicable, not only to your legal practice, and I'll pull it all together for you a couple times, but also for your personal um, knowledge. Just sort of framing all of what happened this morning um, in a broader context based on my experience. And, and I do that because I don't know uh, about you guys, but I know that when I go to my CLEs, you know, there comes a point when my eyes glaze over, and if my eyes aren't glazing over, my brain definitely is. So we're going to do a little shock therapy, um, so to speak, and um, hopefully give you good fodder for going back to, if not your firm's, certainly your personal life, and, and really think through what you're doing as far as um, your interconnectivity via the internet and other mechanisms. First of all, I have to tell you about a book that just came out. I don't know how many of you are um, spy novel enthusiasts, but one of my all-time favorites is John le Carre. Um, one of my all-time favorites of him is The Spy Who Came In From the Cold, by the way, set in Panama where I did a tour, really very indicative of how um, traditional human intelligence collection, human, is conducted. And what this new book talks about is it takes the characters from his The Spy Who Came In From The Cold novel and updates them. Um, and do any of you have any idea what the new updated threat is that these characters are dealing with? You would think, given the topic of the day, it would be cyber, but it's not. It's not terrorism, maybe the Russians, not the Russians. Uh, how many of you thought maybe it's um, some kind of nanotechnology or bio or, or other chemical threat? Nope, not that. Guess what it is? It's lawyers. <laughs> Literally, it's an existential threat of a lawsuit um, that could break things wide open. So in that context, you can sort of get an idea of, of my approach. It, but what, what the book really does is talk about a couple of things that is the most important context for what I think we're dealing today. And that is there are huge changes in technology, not just cyber. And those changes are happening at a pace that is unprecedented in human history. And you are all going to have to deal with that, not only as individuals, not only as professionals, um, but as lawyers, and one of the things that is very difficult to persuade partners, businessmen, and even individuals is, a lot of times we could get through our lives with, yeah, we could adapt two or three things from a technological advancement, and, and then you can sort of shut down and let somebody else take care of it. I don't know about the rest of you, but whenever I hear the conversations that occurred this morning, I'm like, oh, there's somebody in our firm who's looking into that. Ah, the IT guys have got it. Oh, we have that really good CIO guy. 
I, if he doesn't know this stuff, it's not my responsibility to, you know, like stick my nose in his business. Oh, yeah, we have a firm. It does our data management. Um, I don't know if they're encrypting. I don't know if my phone or my BlackBerry is encrypted. I mean, someone would tell me if it had to be. And let me tell you, you're wrong. Um, unfortunately, particularly in the legal field, we are woefully behind. Um, and the new Verizon uh, report of last year uh, sets forth the kind of professional institutions, the kind of information that are most uh, often the, the target of hacks, and you guys are right square in the middle of it. Um, so why do what I have to say have to deal with, with any of you if I'm not going to talk about compliance? Um, I'm going to talk to you because many of you are partners and you have equity stakes um, in your revenues or how your firms are doing. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you about has direct implications on your liability um, from your firm's perspective and your revenues. Um, and for those of you who are sole practi practitioners, excuse me, um, you're also, you really need to pay attention. Um, Secondly, if any of you have uh, government clients, um, there are new requirements out um, that are put forward not only for classified information, not only for private, personal private information, but a whole new category, excuse me, category of sensitive information that pertains to what the government is doing, government plans and attention, that you are now required um, by the end of this year to have a, identified what that information is, to have a plan for protecting that information, to have a plan for uh, providing notice and mitigating damage of breach, breach meaning that someone has hacked and gathered information from you, and a, a myriad of other things. And for those of you who don't fall into any of those categories, you are representing clients who either are gain revenue from government contracts uh, here in Colorado, with a fair amount of government work going on, either directly or as subcontractors. The requirements flow down to the subcontractors under the new legislation, um, or they are recipients of government grants. Uh, they also have to be compliant with the new regulations. So this is actually um, about you. The other, the other problem is, um, if you deal with any of this in the national security context, um, it is my understanding that all of these problems that we're going to be talking about, they're going to get worse. At the same time, business practices and, and cyber threats are getting more sophisticated. And at exactly the same time, I understand uh, that Colorado is looking for high-tech companies that are traditionally on the east or west coast are trying to move into the middle America area and your state is attempting through tax and other um, attractiveness to have these high-tech companies come here. Um, so you in particular need to be aware of what is going on in the threats and challenges area. So when I talk to um, folks about cyber or nano threats or um, some of the other things that are going around, going on around us that are really challenges to our our lifestyle and the way we exist, I generally try to categorize the people in my head. And there's the people over 50 like me. When I started college, uh, I used my typewriter. I was delighted by the high tech introduction of the little white <laughs> correcting tape that allowed you to go back and type over. That was, talk about a time saver. Um, I remember before I graduated, there was a computer class offered, and you got these great sort of cardboardish cards with holes punched in them that you went to the computer and you had to keep them in order. God forbid that you dropped them, and you put those in the computer, and it told the computer what to do, and that was about all I thought I was ever going to need on computers. And in fact, when I went to CIA, they had a thing called the Wang. Anybody been exposed to the Wang? Oh my God, I love you guys. The Wang was, I figured that was going to last my lifetime. Um, and in fact, when I worked for China Ops, 
um, the China Operations Center was so convinced that there could not possibly be a computer on the planet, even the Wang, that wasn't penetrated, that we would get our reports from our China spies and have to, and, and you'd have your scissors and your glue, and you would cut, if you were editing, the reports and paste them back together to be photocopied at the cut and paste afterwards so that nobody can penetrate your system. And I remember a couple years thinking, oh my God, that, that was just crazy. Well, after today, you might be ordering yourself some scissors and some paste. But, but, we, but we're the, we're the, the over 50 year olds, we're, we're like, look, I've got the computer, I've got it down, I can edit documents, I can even cut and paste a couple of charts, I can post it, I can go in and reformat. If you're a litigator, I can make it fit so that I'm under the page limit. I can reduce the number of spaces between the letters and the lines to make sure I get the maximum on every page without the court noticing. I mean, that is about all you can ask. And besides, I'm now leading my firm. I'm busy. Somebody else can take care of that stuff. And you know, on a good day, I might get around and maybe check a news site or two. Maybe I've, I've ordered something on the internet, maybe not, but that's about it. So this conversation really isn't for me because I'm not really all that exposed. And then you've got the millennials who cannot communicate without something electronic, either doing it for them or in front of them. There is a huge cultural gap, but it's also a huge understanding gap. I mean, these guys go to the internet for work, for play, for word processing. They go to it for shopping, for entertainment. They literally have their friendships via the internet. They are a total different animal. And, and they actually, most of them can write some code, can make some changes, and during the course of the day, the majority of them sitting at their desks are checking either Twitter accounts, Instagram accounts, Facebook accounts, 50 to 60 times a day, at least. Many of them will argue that that's their right, that's the First Amendment right, um, and in fact, that that is also their right as individuals. And, you know, we chat by the water cooler, there's no, nothing different than that. And then there's the people in the middle who are pretty sure that somebody else is taking care of this, they're a little bit better than the, the senior partner who really actually secretly still writes the hand correction in and gives it to his secretary or his paralegal. Um, I, many of those in my firm. Um, or, or, or just really, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this doesn't touch their firm besides they've got a whole admin section that sort of deals with the gap between the two. Um, you need to bridge the gaps in your firm, and you need to bridge the gaps today and sort of self-identify where you fit into those three categories. Um, just a quick note, although I'm gonna focus on cybersecurity, for those of you who are interested in truly dealing with what may be coming your way out of um, Silicon Valley, there are nano um, technology developments that make everything that we'll talk about today even more scary or artificial intelligence advances that will have a huge impact on your life, even to the extent that in the next decade, some of the cyber attacks or the cyber privacy or the information sharing issues that we're all dealing with and assuming that somewhere along the way there's a human being involved, um, that will no longer be the case that because we are now developing, even in the most simple of machines, artificial intelligence that is designed to make your life more efficient, whether it's to allow you from a remote location to turn on the lights in your house, or to check the video of the guy who's ringing your doorbell, or turn down your thermostat, or even your baby monitor, that at some point, um, many artificial intelligence machines will, will be aggregating information and coordinating it on their own initiative with no human being either directly involved or knowledgeable. But anyway, your practice is going to be substantially shaped by a lot of really complex technology. And that technology is going to have an impact on 
complex financial arrangements and on legal and, and other uh, aggregation of information, whether they're financial investment structures or whether they're cutting edge technology IP developments or scientific developments or new requirements um, as uh, healthcare talks to issues not just about personal information but bio gathering. That's very soon, um, in the next decade actually, there's a, a lot of effort, particularly with the government, for your personal information in the healthcare field to include your biometrics, which means not only your thumbprints, your iris scans, but um, very possibly portions of your DNA. Um, they'll also be ever evolving and the clients that you're dealing with will be even more exposed to global um, laws, regulations, and other information systems that are gonna have a huge, huge implication for the conduct of your business. And for the first time on top of all of this, you and your firms are going to be dealing with the fact that anyone anywhere in the world can reach into your organization and steal your client's most secret information and their most protected secrets. And that's just not talking about your litigation strategy or that one document that you really hope the other side doesn't find or that you found um, that's the smoking gun and is going to win your case. It's, it's your personnel files, of course, but it's the tax filings. It's the confidential financial information that your client either produced as part of discovery or um, you're dealing with as his attorney. It's your employee gripes. It's the emails where people say things between each other that you really wish they hadn't said um, that are somewhere in a file because you went through hoping to find that they were privileged and you didn't have to produce them. They're your privileged flyers, excuse me, files. It's your client's growth strategy. It's their EEO complainers. It's their insurance gaps. It's their product information. It's their competitive planning and a lot more. All of that is sitting somewhere in your firms, either as part of your representation of them or in response to requests for information. Many times it's all identified by client name. It's aggregated so that anyone in your firm could go in and find, or your paralegals and your lawyers can have access. And for me as the bad guy, that is one stop shopping. Why bother to go to my client and have to search through gigabytes when I can go to his lawyer and find all of it in one client repository? You may be, in fact, one of your client's most weak links. And for those of you who are sitting here thinking, wow, this really doesn't apply to me because you know I, I just do the personnel stuff. Um, many of you, and again, I'm going to emphasize this, who are dealing with subcontractors or contractors who've never touched classified information, but they're working on a project, it's construction, it's architectural design, whatever it is that would have never occurred to them to be sensitive are going to have to look at the new requirements. By the way, again, deadline is December of this year for 2017 for compliance purposes to identify sensitive information um, regarding how you're going to deal with it, what, uh, what cyber program you have in place, how you mitigate disclosure, and, and how you uh, have a mechanism and a process in place, you meaning your client, for identifying breaches. Okay, so now that you have got your attention, um, I wanna talk just a second because I'm going to hammer you with scary things for the rest of my talk about one of the really interesting benefits of technology. We all know what the benefits of technology are. You know, it helps us be more efficient. It helps us uh, aggregate information, uh, develop a logarithm and get uh, through the processing of it really quickly. But I had to, this came up the other day in a firm that I'm helping with and I had to tell you, um, it, it represented uh, an aspect of cyber security and cyber uh, challenges, but also cyber opportunity that I hadn't thought of. And that has nothing to do with information breaches, nothing. It's about human behavior. Those of us in the national security field will tell you at least 
depending on the day, 40 to 60% of the problem is human behavior. It's not your equipment. It's not the, the stuff you have. It's your processes. It's your lack of processes. But most importantly, it's, it's human behavior. Anecdote. A law firm that was litigating a very contentious case decided they were interested in what the government might be saying about the case offline. Um, so what they did was decided, we wonder what, there's a lot of millennials, no offense to the young people in the room, but we know how they communicate. We know they keep in touch with their friends and family on a daily basis. It's a lot over the term of a trial to expect people not to sort of check in with friends and family via Twitter, via Snapchat, via whatever. Let's legally monitor that. What they were able to find was that a significant portion of the opposing team, these were AUSAs, by the way, who even had accounts that were not identified with them by name, disclosed either information in the trial or bragged about what was going on. That's what we do. We're human. And while the disclosure of information wasn't particularly harmful, over the course of time, the venom and the attitude of the government team became so apparent that when given this information to the judge, the judge admonished the government and the AUSA team, let's just say there were some changes made in the personnel that were litigating the case on the government side. It was a significant achievement on, on the part of the defendant, number one. Number two, um, it actually teetered as to whether or not there was a malicious prosecution claim because of chatting during the trial by the government lawyers. Really interesting, something to think about. I'm going to talk a lot about the context and in, in, in the context that my national security background sort of leads me to is I talk about cyber threats, cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber espionage, cyber sabotage, and even cyber crime. Most people, when they're lawyers, think that has nothing to do with me. Oh, let me tell you how much it has to do with you, particularly when it comes to cyber crime. As you know, and I'm going to back up for a second for context, um, there are a myriad of, of threats to nation states. And, and in particular, in the past, those have been state actors against state actors. Well, that has changed. And that's changed for you as well. Non-state actors are now some of the most pernicious threats that are available in the cyber context. And that, that goes through everyone from anonymous, anonymous, an, an, an organization that is ill-defined and, and perhaps not even definable, to companies and individuals. And, and these are out there to steal secrets, hold information for, as hostage for financial gain. And I know Ed talked about that for a while. Stop or start an attack how devastating would it be if in the middle of a trial or a negotiation, if your entire firm's computer system went down? Surveil your infrastructure or even our nation's critical infrastructure. Plant malicious or destructive software. Silence opposition. Spy on diplomats, businesses, and opponents. And even spread disinformation that given the, the rapidity of which information flows right now, one of the major concerns the government has, and a major concern for you, is that there's this assumption when you things, find things on the internet, well, it must be true. This document that I found, this smoking gun document, must be true. Disinformation on the internet, even those held in others' files, is becoming such a problem because with the rapidity of public information being disseminated in an internet, it becomes fact 
before a discerning eye even questions whether or not there's any basis for the representation made in the document, the news site, the tape, or whatever. And it's going to become an increasing a challenge for businessmen, but particularly with lawyers, about discerning that document could have just as easily been planted by your opponents as it was if you found when your client turned over his logs in order for you to comply with discovery. That there's got to be an auditable and audit trail for you to ensure that what you think you have is real. Now, I know we did this a little bit before, but I want to ask a couple questions, and there's a method to why I'm asking you. How many of you in the room, and I honestly now, and everybody promises that they won't look and say, oh my god, that was the guy from... How many of you think or, or know in your heart that your firm has been penetrated? Okay, handful, okay? How many of you think that you've been hacked, but you're pretty sure that nothing was lost? You would have known if something was lost. Okay. And how many of you on an individual basis think that your personal information is out there for anyone to buy um, significant enough, excuse me, to present a, a, an existential threat to your finances, for your identity, or whatever? How many individually? Okay, well, this is a smarter group than I thought. But you guys are from Colorado, you know. I'm just joking. I'm joking, I'm joking. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be considering moving here otherwise. Um, just for all of you to know, and this is before the Equifax um, breach, 64% of Americans have um, self-reported uh, personal uh, major attacks that resulted in data breach. Um, and you know what the more amazing thing is? And it gets to the behavior issue. Of that 64%, 40% are still using the same or similar passwords on most websites. <coughs> Behavior. In um, fiscal year 2015 alone, um, according to the most recent study that's put out, the United States government experienced at least 77,000 cyber attacks, or approximately 210 per day. The preliminary, preliminary figures for 2016 are that there are well over 100,000 attacks that have been identified and reported and that the Department of Defense alone and all its facilities probably experience um, upwards of 200 attacks or attempted attacks a day. As you can imagine, our leaders in Washington are doing um, pretty much all they can do to defend against these attacks, to deter the perpetrators, and to deliver the response. And if you think about it, they've got all the tools available at their disposal, at their disposal, excuse me, tools that you don't even have. Well, let me tell you, they don't have a strategy, and they don't even have a single point of entry for people to report attacks, even when those attacks occur um, for sensitive or protected information. So let's talk about really how bad is the threat? I mean, come on, is it really going to enter into my life? On Tuesday, how many of you are aware of what CNN Money and, um, and CNBC reported on Tuesday about Yahoo? Okay, on Yahoo, Yahoo came out on Tuesday and said, you know, that report in July that said one-third of our account users have been penetrated. Well, we've, we, we've gone back and looked at it. It's not one in three of our account holders. It's all of them. And um, that's about three billion of you. Three billion Yahoo account holders were penetrated in July. Now, what does that mean, penetrated? What is the breach? Well, the breach is email addresses, passwords, birth dates, telephone numbers, and more. And this is based on Yahoo's own reporting. The good news, if there is a silver lining, is that what wasn't breached was passwords in clear text. So the passwords were passed, but they were encrypted. Um, payment 
card data and credit card data and bank accounts, that information was segregated and not breached. All of you are familiar, I hope, with the Equifax breach that was recently reported. For those of you who are not, um, that impacted 143 million Americans. Um, as those of you who or have, been, have been preoccupied, uh, Equifax is one of our three major credit bureaus. Uh, according to Equifax, and here's the killer, the breach actually lasted from May to July, three months, over 2017. And what the hackers got were people's names, their social security numbers, their birth date, their addresses, and their driver's license numbers. To add insult to injury, um, Equifax has made clear that they know for a fact that 209,000 people also lost credit card numbers and other identifying information, and that 182,000 people on top of that lost all of that information plus any dispute documents um, for example, if you were going back and forth and saying, no, this isn't my credit information, or um, no, this wasn't a 90-day late payment, it was a 30-day, all of those were in separate files, and for 182,000 of you, you lost those as well. Um, just if it makes you feel bad, the U.S. government is, is pretty much not too much better off. Um, for those of you who follow these kinds of things, in 19, or excuse me, in 2015 in June, an entity called the Office of Personnel Management um, was breached. At that time, the largest breach in US government history. A lot of you are saying, oh, I don't care. Well, if you've ever owned a security clearance or you've ever applied for a security clearance um, or your clients have, that was the repository of that information. What does that mean? That means all your identifying information, your fingerprints, any kind of other biometrics, um, and also the investigation documents for anybody who applied for those clearances. So when they went to your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend or your ex-wife or your ex-husband and they said, what a piece of garbage. You know, he couldn't balance a budget and I couldn't trust him and she had a marital affair and that means she can't hold secrets. Somewhere in China, all of that is floating around. The problem with that is since this information pertains to our security clearance holders or applicants, what a chance to blackmail. Oh, so you had that affair, did you? Does your wife know? Neighbor knew? Really scary. At one point, um, while the initial reporting was about 3.6 million people were impacted, the current total after the series of breaches is about 22.1 million people had their information uh, stolen, and that's about one out of every 15 Americans. So statistically, a couple people in this room um, are, have files that are being read by the Chinese. Um, this week alone, it's been a banner week, uh, yesterday, there was a reporting um, that in 2015, uh, Russia stole from the NSA uh, planning and other documents that talk about how we defend ourselves against cyber um, and major breaches. Those have been turned over to at least the Russians. Uh, many of those also had the techniques and procedures as well as the software and other um, procedures that the NSA and our highest cl clearance entities have um, had and held. Um, even more alarming is how the foreign agents became aware of all of this. According to the report, the hackers actually noticed it when they were um, aware of penetrations via their Kaspersky antivirus software. How many of you have Kaspersky in your firm or on your computers? I bet it's just not one of you. Some of you may not even know. Yeah, well, the big, the, the shoe that hasn't dropped is the determination that Kaspersky is and has always been a role, uh, uh, playing a role of penetration for the Russian government. Uh, and anything on a computer since the beginning of time 
that has Kaspersky antivirus software um, was actually downloading anything that it had access to somewhere to Boris and his, and his computer network. Of course, this is just the most recent in uh, breaches of the NSA. For those of you who pay attention to this kind of thing, we had the Snowden affair. That had in included some NSA documents, of course. We have um, Harold Martin, who was the most recent contractor, who was charged with taking home classified documents. I actually think he sent a document that he was working on to his home computer, um, and then when it, when it came back or that sending allowed um, at the penetration through the NSA system. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know that when I would go away for long weekends and are on vacation um, and I was at a place where the internet was slow, it was so hard to get into the, the barrier of the law firm that you had to log in, then you had to remember some super generated whatever it is, and then you had to go through like 99 steps for this whatever it is document that I really needed access to. And you know the hotel's internet would go so slowly that I couldn't make changes or it really didn't do well with, with track changes. So you know we all downloaded that document onto our computer or onto something that we bought from the store so we're positive it's safe, the thumb drive. And let me tell you, whenever all of that happened, penetration occurred. Um, don't forget Chelsea Manning, and don't forget Reality Winner. Why do people do this to their children? Um, a, a poor, a, a woman who I'm sure it's a right name for her, I don't mean to disparage it, but Reality Winner um, thought that leaking classified documents on the Russian election was her uh, civic duty, and ha that has resulted in a major, major Leaking it just provides a highway for someone to go back through um, loss of NSA information. Uh, and this doesn't even talk about the ongoing leak of NSA um, tools and documents that is um, related to the Russian government. I don't want to speak too far. And these are the shadow brokers. How many of you heard of the shadow brokers? It's a group out there who's made it their mission. Um, a little bit like um, our WikiLeaks folk to penetrate uh, and compromise the NSA. And that, and that compromise has been ongoing. Um, they think at least for a couple years, they, they, I think they discovered it in August of 2016, um, and that we only became aware of it that spring. So um, I will tell you, having a front row seat in the Situation Room where we were dealing with the fact that, you know, today while I was working on my NATO nuclear policy, somebody came into the room and said, sorry, Secretary Long, we need to download your hard drive. We were penetrated by the Chinese today. Uh, and that happened all over government. And we sit in the situation room to prepare options for the president. Um, and we talk about, yeah, come on. I mean, we need, there has to be something that we should be doing here. You know what, incredibly, Guess what the most significant hurdle the government faces, and I have to say, significant hurdle, excluding the fact that we're not organized to actually deal with this threat at all, in determining how to approach these problems. It's legal. At least when I was there, and I'm a little dated, the big problem was how do you, since we're not legally permissive, permitted to engage in military activities on the internet could be a I mean are you are you cyber declaring war um, what are the parameters and the and the line between defensive and offensive measures and we wound ourselves around the axle like you wouldn't believe of course this was prior to Stuxnet um, which may or may not have solved or worsened that problem but that's a discussion for another day. Um, in fact, the amazing thing is I could sit here and, and Ed could sit here and tell you about how all these cyber threats you need to be aware of, but as soon as you walk out of this room, um, the threat has changed. It is evolving more rapidly than our ability to deal with it. Um, the good news of all of that is 80% 
of cyber breaches are motivated by financial gain and not by espionage or even by fun. And in fact, if you combine all the espionage and fun uh, breaches, uh, they don't even come close to those that are motivated by financial gain. Um, and in fact, um, as I said, and I think Ed talked about, the, the good news is also you only have to deal with somewhere between 5% and 20% of the internet. That's the internet as we all know it. Underneath that is somewhere between 95% and 80% of the internet that probably very few of us in this room, maybe Ed, now that we know that he's a hacker, um, have ever been exposed to. Um, and, and that is the internet of things. Um, and that actually is the internet where um, someone estimated um, very recently that there will be over 20 billion connected devices by 2020, four years from now, three, and where um, the, the problem of artificial intelligence and these 20 billion connected separate internet entities will most likely link together in order to help you be more efficient and more uh, connected um, where the government is at least concerned um, where the biggest threat will come from. So what's the meaning of all of this? Um, cybersecurity is a huge threat. It's going to continue to grow. And you need to take an active role, um, if not in your own personal life, but in your firm's life, because many of you will suffer the consequences of assuming that somebody else is handling it, and they may not be. Um, the fact is the finest militaries, the finest foot soldiers, ISIS, we can talk about ISIS ad nauseum, um, insurgencies who are fighting, and even high school truants are probably better prepared to deal with the cyber threats than many of the people in this room. Um, and um, the fact of the matter is somewhere out there there's a high-end corporate spy who was hired by a private investigator who could be sitting in the hotel lobby as we speak now with your computers and your phones on, even for those of you who don't have the Share app on, who's downloading what you have on your electronic devices as we speak. People say that's nonsense. Anecdote. I work for some very large defense contractors. I promise you that happens every day and every conference. And if you think, well, I don't really, I, I keep my computer clean, I keep my phone clean, I really don't do much. Conference attendees who are being really good have their little hard drive. If they have to make a change, they go to the business office, they log in or quickly make the change. They don't even log into the internet because they are not going to risk. They make the change, they print it, they delete the document. Guess what? A whole slew of people like me go in in the morning and the evening, get onto the computer, and I will go into the printing queue and download, I think the worst, my worst day was 15, 20 presentations, revised contracts, revised proposals of the guys who printed it that day being super stealthy with all the protected information on it. Printing queues, or they just forget to delete the document or they close it thinking it's deleted and you can go back in um, to the backup systems that the computers run and just go find it. So the real quick question is, you know, at what point does all of the stuff our firm has make my law firm or me a major target for litigants? Um, and how much really is my duty to protect clients' information um, and the idea that I have to have security equipment and practices that are deemed adequate. Um, I thought I had thought of this myself, but Ed, uh, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, actually has interesting information on someone that has figured that out, that there is a living to be made on going back to law firms and saying, you 
have not protected your information at a minimal adequacy, and that leaves you liable and exposed. Now, drop it at that. It could be a whole a different category, and I'll leave that. I'll leave that to Anne to um, to add. I have to tell you, I thought it was ironic. I actually got on the Equifast uh, webpage today after everything had happened, and I'm going to give you the quote. Um, this is in the advertisement where it's talking about its its data protection services. Quote: Data breaches are creating significant personal and financial risk for an increasing number of consumers and businesses. Equifax data protection services can help you manage those concerns. Somewhere, there's somebody that should have advised them to maybe revisit that page. I just thought it was astonishing. But from a legal perspective, at what point are consumers, your potential clients, and maybe your clients today, going to demand, and maybe through litigation, that organizations that, op that operate for profit, like Equifax, that have astonishing amounts of their personal information, not by choice. Nobody, nobody sent that off to Equifax. They have gathered that. But they don't have a choice because the, the, the idea of not having a credit bureau have your information, you need that for access to credit, to buy your home, your mortgage, credit cards. At what point are consumers going to say, enough is enough? I have no choice in this. I demand a minimal amount of accountability. And the idea that these people are profiting off of this with me not having the ability for some kind of recompense is unreasonable. I think that day, if not already here, is happening. For those of you who follow us, the consumer blah, 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 protection bureau, their solution to the problem after telling Equifax, by the way, after your breach, you might not want to charge people for your data protection services. <laughs> Unseemly. Um, their solution to the problem is to embed a couple of their investigators in the um, in companies. Unclear what companies, unclear what that's going to do, but I, I got to tell you, I, I'm pretty sure I'm on there and not even close to satisfying my concerns, but I was blown by the OPM thing anyway. Um, but too often, you know, we actually, us, facilitate um, the disposal or the distribution of critical information ourselves. Um, and, and this gets back to the drafting problem. This gets back uh, to the, the associate or partner who's sitting at the firm trying to buy that car, put a bid in. It's really cool. It's a Mustang, vintage. Had an awesome weekend with my friend. Let's get ticket for the concert tonight. Takes that nanosecond to, while the document is up, oh, you know, I, I, I'm stuck, and I just need to walk away from this because I can't get this, this sentence right. I can't get this document right. I'm waiting for opposing counsel to call back. I'm waiting for the person from personnel to really make sure that these were the employment dates. I'm just going to jump over for a second and check my Facebook page or my Twitter account or Drudge. CNN News, just for a second, just going to leap over. Ah, I'm not going to do it with my work computer. I'll do it on my phone. It should be safe that way. Ed talked a little bit about spear phishing. Spear phishing are those dangerous links in emails or social media posts from unknown or even trusted user. They're a well-known phenomena. All of us look, whew, that doesn't look like Fred. I'm not going to click on that. But what you don't know is that Drudge and CNN, at one point in time, were the most prolific distributors of phishing spears on the internet. So when you, you go through a, a website, oh, this article looks interesting. Click, click, that unbeknownst to these providers, embedded in that click, click, so I can read the whole article, we're spear phishing enterprises. So it's really frightening. So you're aware of the threat? You don't click on any of those? A recent study found that 56% of email recipients 
and around 40% of Facebook users still click on unknown emails, and most of them self-report that they do it out of curiosity. Behavior. As bad as our decisions really are, um, the good news is that it isn't all about tech, and it isn't about keeping up with the most late, the most recent software and the most recent patch. A lot of it really is about behavior, and behavior we can change through education. Um, this is a big issue for me, uh, and for all of you that looked around at each other and said, I don't need to know who in my firm handles this stuff, and I don't know who our CIO is or our IO is, or what are we using encryption? I don't know. Is there end-to-end -end encryption? I don't know. It's not, not really my gig. I'm the partner. I'm the whatever it is. Well, you're going to have to be educated, and so is the rest of your firm. And woe be to you if you are in a situation where a client or an, opposite or an, op an opponent basically charges you with inadequate protections and you haven't educated. Um, national security professionals every year are forced under the threat of losing their email access and their internet access to complete an interactive information protecting, protection course and an examination. Every law firm should do the same. Protecting our practices. Whether you are practicing for money or pro bono, you're likely to appreciate the information security is, is could be uh, the difference between winning a case or losing it. Uh, you know that there's compliance issues. Um, you know that it, with it, the value of discovery, the value of research is important, and cyber is critical to that. Um, you know, maybe, maybe in your hard drive for exculpatory or for damning information, you dig down e deep into your opponent. Um, but basically, your firms haven't adopted that approach. The ABA study in 2016 found that 14% of respondents reported that their firm experienced cyber breach. So the raise of hands today was not statistically represented. And those are the ones who knew they were pen penetrated and reported it. Um, according to one report, the phishing expeditions that result in um, basically holding your, your information hostage uh, has undergone a 300% increase since 2015. The costs to our firms are not just a loss of billable hours, the costs for repairing and replacing hardware and software, destroyed or lost data, damage to client relationships, and opportunity costs as, as your partners, associates, paralegals are unable to work more efficiently and effectively. Um, there's a huge loss of confidence issue. And it's not just the confidence that your clients have, it's the confidence in your firm of where's my information and how do I represent to my really important client that he's safe. I don't know, are we safe? Um, if you don't think this is pernicious, let me tell you a little bit about how pernicious all of this has been. In 2015, um, the Joint Chief of Staff had a penetration by the Russians that was so pernicious and so controlled, absolute control of their cyber systems that they had to completely shut down the network in the Pentagon for two weeks. Two weeks. For two weeks, if you walked into the E-ring, which is the outermost ring, which is where all the really important stuff goes on in the Pentagon, it's where the joint staff is, it's where the policy considerations are, you would see people standing up against their windows like this. And those were the few people that had their Blackberries because Blackberry wasn't shut down and they were hoping to get a signal so they could actually work that day. Two weeks. And that's the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Data breaches are not limited to classified information. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, but having your non-classified hacks 
can really make your leadership question whether their plans or their information is not in the hands of their opponents. From a litigation strategy standpoint, from a planning document that your client has, from his next year's financial projection as he's going through a merger and acquisition, that one troublesome employee, do I have to disclose it? I've got some EEO litigation, can I settle it fast? Who has that information? And if your opponent is really smart, he's out there looking for it. Finally, I just want to touch upon one more thing. How am I doing time-wise, guys? Whenever you're ready, we'll do the panel. All right. I worry, as a, as a lawyer who's turned national security um, practitioner, um, that very often when people talk about cyber and IT responsibility, um, that there's not enough linkage to our, the trust inherent in our relationship with our clients and privilege. Um, in, an, in a cyber minefield era, maintaining privilege requires more than discretion. Um, indeed, I think the very concept of privilege could be at risk um, if and when we don't keep up with the evolving norms for secrecy and privacy um, that are evolving with cyber and that are evolving as we struggle with um, privacy issues writ large. Um, one of the, we all know the 2014 uh, Sony Pictures attack and, and you know there weren't really any secrets disposed or exposed and we're all familiar with the really embarrassing emails um, that basically between executives that were published for all the world to see. Um, do you think that did not almost paralyze that firm during that period with everybody else wondering, oh my God, I'm having an affair with my, is that email exposed? The, the impact on an organization beyond that which is, is public is tremendous. What wasn't public is the real question about anything that was legal that was gathered up on all that and whether privacy had or hadn't been waived intentionally or not intentionally and what were the clients and the lawyers obligation to assume that certain litigation strategies were waived, that certain financial in, it, it, it documents were out there for the public and, and, and and do you wait for it to be exposed to say, well, this is, you know, it wasn't intentionally waived. No one could have known about the hack. Well, that now that hacking is a, day, a daily event for all of us, and we all know we have to keep our privileged information unhackable or something like that, what about the argument that you didn't bother to even fulfill the minimal standards for cybersecurity? So in effect, you made a corporate decision that your privileged documents, although not intentionally exposed, the inadvertency was so, was so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Foreseeable, was so inevitable that your claims for privilege you know, are pretty weak on this. You, or you knew there was a hack, you had to assume that document was out there and you did nothing. Don't know. And finally, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of organizations that are increasingly making undermining secrecy um, you know, part of their, their mission. And I, I really understand that um, you know, when stealing privileged information, stealing information from governments, from institutions, from bad companies, from individuals, you know, and maybe this is a noble cause because as many of our most important cyber conglomerates will say, you know, there should, be, I don't know if any of you spend time uh, reading some of the, the, the folk from Facebook and other places, they really believe that, that, that there should be this open, laissez-faire uh, marketplace of information on the web. That really, while there may be some things that should be secret and private, um, from, from most perspectives, you know, everything should be readily available. 
You know, I, I get that some people might think that that's a noble cause. Um, and I, I think that maybe even some attorneys might leverage that information for their own cases. But I think examples of what is happening is are really frightening harbingers of a profession when built on privilege and having your clients most secret concepts and information, um, it, it's really gonna be a challenge for the legal field. Um, in addition to the fact of just the physical protection of information and, and privacy norms that are going to evolve. I mean, we protect our clients' most important secrets. Um, and all it, is it takes is an outdated server. By the way, in the partnership meeting last year when you were going to spend $5 million to update your servers, but everybody says, well, they can't be that old. And you decided to go a couple more years and keep that one antiquated server. That server alone is a vulnerability. Or, or, or you didn't update your computer units. Or you, know, you have a curious lawyer who's never been told, while you're sitting in that chair in this law firm, you may not access Twitter, the internet, blah, 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 blah. Because even in reading the news, you can click on a phishing leak. You know, what does that mean? We, we could be the weakest link. And this can really undermine our reputations, our professional reputations, and, and, and really result in a, a question as to whether we're reliable and responsible stewards of privileged information. I have to end on something a little uplifting. Um, in, in, in the realm of embarrassing things that other fi people find amusing but could be used as illustrative examples of things. So I was not a technical person when I worked at CIA and, and then I went to Williams and Connolly Law Firm and I learned way too much about litigation strategy and, and I thought I was one of a lawyer. So I went into DOD for a year because I really wanted to return to government service after 9-11 and I figure I, the best way to do that is just tell them I'm here and I'll do this for a year because I'll go back because I love litigation. And one year turned into five and I ended up with five jobs in four years where I, they kept adding to the plate. So there was one moment in time where I had um, literally responsibility for policy making for the entire globe and they added the Helsinki um, negotiations and then um, the fact that I would be the first woman chair of NATO's nuclear um, body, the high level group, which reports directly to, to NATO's secretary general, which meant that I even had another boss. And I, um, in a moment of despair uh, at, a, at a cocktail on a Friday night after all this had happened said, you know, I am not Wonder Woman. So of course my friends, being my worst enemies, um, showed up on Monday, or actually showed up on Sunday morning with Wonder, Wear, Wonder Woman bracelets uh, because they thought that was hilarious. I'm like, okay, you guys, you people. Um, ha, 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 I'll take your jokes and I'll wear them. So you know, we, when you're in Washington, you wear boring clothes. So, and I always wear, wear really long cuffs with, you know, whatever. So I put the bracelets on, and I was going to say, ha, I wore them to work. I have no problem with you guys making this joke. I forgot that I had, I was stepping in for the Secretary of Defense um, that day in a situation room meeting, and um, would be sitting with the National Security Advisor and the President. So luckily, because I was panic stricken, it's a big job. I got there super early because I, got, I was sitting at the table, which is for all of you who know how all this works, is a huge deal. And as I'm loading all my books up and everything, of course my sleeve goes up. And I don't think really anyone's noticing and I pull my sleeves back down and the national security advisor, I see him and the president exchange looks. And the national security advisor leaned over to me and said, Mary Beth, do you have Wonder Woman bracelets on? <laughs> they had the big W. <laughs> and I said, yes, actually, I do. <laughs> and someone else in the room who shall remain nameless said, it's a good thing 
now we know you're taking this job seriously. <laughs> How am I going to tie this into this situation? There is no superhero when it comes to cybersecurity. There's no superhero with dealing all of this. But um, having heard maybe a little bit more context than the average bear gets to hear on cybersecurity, you really do need to go back to your firms or take a look at even your family financials and be the hero. Um, because it's, it's no longer the case that you, that you can't pay attention to these things. Either it's going, to, it's going to impact, this is by the way after I spilled the coffee on the Secretary of Defense in front of the entire world on civets, so I, it was a banner week for me. Um, but you really do have to take a role in this because the problem is if you're like me and everybody else, you're assuming somebody else does it. You're, you're, you're more than busy with what's on your plate. The last thing you need to do is add something that you don't really understand. It's not your job. Somewhere there are people that are much more savvy about it than you. And even to the extent that they are, there's really not that much you can do about it. I mean, that's how I always felt. And I, honestly, I still feel that way. But you need to go back to your firms and to your family and at least check into some of these things because the financial impact really is enormous. And you know, and I'm going to bring it back up to a second. There, there's a lot of debate in the national security community. Is you know, does North Korea really have to hit us with a nuclear weapon in order to really paralyze the U.S.? You know, does Iran really need us to abrogate the Iranian deal? Um, in order to have its nuclear development program, you know, speed forward and have a nuclear-capable warhead in Iranian hands. It, the fact is that it's, it's much easier to paralyze um, the U.S. economy um, and frustrate um, U.S. civilians with um, a, a, a complete either EMP, which takes out all electric connectivity, but even you know a week without your internet um, and a week without banks being able to distribute funds through ATMs and your bank account information not being available so no one really knows what's in your account or not, or not being able to use your credit card because the grocery stores can't really verify whether that's you on that credit card because someone's gone into um, those accounts. So you have to basically have cash, and how many of you have cash enough to get your family through a week? And oh, by the way, you can't go to the gas station because most of those are credit cards and someone's turned off the pumps anyway because you know all of this is cascading. Um, that actually is much easier, and in fact, from sheer infrastructure penetrations alone, um, the East Coast has barely escaped having um, its electric grid down several times in the past. Um, and what that does to your financial institutions, what that does to major distributors, what that does to SWIFTs, uh, SWIFT was also at one point a huge target for those of you who do international transactions, the SWIFT. You know, what if somebody said, ha ha? We penetrated the SWIFT account and JP Morgan and half a dozen other banks, and we changed every entry by one number, just one. Every, every account number, every balance, every everything, we changed one number. Can you imagine? that They would just shut it down for a while until they figured it out. Unfortunately, consumers would go crazy in the meantime because we've become so dependent. Anyway, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Don't go to North Korea. And um, maybe you should hesitate to go to Iran, unless you have a long-term insurance policy and your spouse really doesn't like you and you're willing for that to be cashed. Thank you.